All right. All right. Okay. Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, of course, and to, uh, to everyone who works to support each other in the, in the family of the church. Um, I have titled uh, this message, the, the Lordly Shepherd. And uh, Psalm 23 is it's something I've been wondering if I should preach on for a long time. It's always been one of my favorite passages in the Bible, maybe my favorite, one of the first, probably the first thing that I ever learned how to uh, memorize was Psalm 23, and I think that's common for a lot of people. Um, the whole book of Psalms is just an amazing book. It, it's, it's, I think it's pretty easy to say that it's the most beloved book in the Bible. Uh, it's a, just a treasury of poetry and prayer, and it's respected the whole world around, even Oh, thank you. Even by people who don't believe in God, they recognize this as an extraordinary and unique uh, book in really in any religious tradition. But the, these poems and prayers uh, have a beauty and an honesty to them that have spoken to people across thousands of years. And the earliest Christian writing about it that we have it's actually from a man named Athanasius. And I'm going to advance this. I'm going to read a little bit about something he says about the book of Psalms. He pastored a church in the city of Alexandria in Egypt uh, about 1,700 years ago, a long time ago. But what he says, I think, is still relevant. Um, he's talking about the unique place that the Psalms have in the Bible. And he, this is all from a letter to a friend of his. If I can get this to advance. Oh. And there we go. OK. And he's, oh, yeah, there we go. He says, look, the, the book of Psalms has a certain grace of its own. He says, the other books in the Bible are relating the things that were written about those earlier people. And likewise, those who listen consider themselves to be other than those about whom the passage speaks. In other words, he's saying it's hard to read uh, Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2 as if it were your own prayer because it, it's so peculiar to her situation, you know? Or it's, it's hard to sing Mary's song in Luke chapter 1 without remembering that this song was really primarily meant for Mary to express her joy at the conception of Jesus. There's many prayers and songs in the Bible, and they, they inspire us, and some of them uh, do get sung in, in church worship, but those other ones, the Bible always frames them as somebody else's words, first and foremost. But take a look at what Athanasius says about the Psalms. He says, by contrast, he who takes up this book, the Psalter, recognizes the Psalms as being his own words. And it seems to me that these words become like a mirror to the person singing them so that he might perceive himself and the emotions of his soul. And other people have paraphrased Athanasius by saying this, uh, most scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. They're in the first person. They're, they're in your own voice in a way. Um, you're meant to sing the Psalms as if they're your own, to pray them, to recite them, and, and to make them your own. Each Psalm unwraps your heart before God and shows him your inner thoughts and fears and desires and shames and temptations and hatreds and loves and joys and, and everything that makes you who you are. And so if you've ever felt, gee, I, I don't really know how to pray. I'm not very good at that. Well, you can still look through and find some psalm that will express something in your heart, and you can pray it. Practice with the Psalms. They teach us how to be vulnerable before God. Confess everything to him. The dark parts, the awkward parts, the weak parts, the confused, the angry, the hurting parts, the wild or the weary parts. This is a sacrifice that God loves to receive. He listens, he hears, he sees, he cares. This is the, probably the first lesson that the Psalms teach. The Lord is approachable. His arms are open to receive all who come to him. And when we give 
up to him, our very selves, he gives us in trade something that's even more valuable, his own very self. And we see this pattern in a lot of the Psalms. A lot of times the psalmist begins by talking about himself, his fears or, or uh, his trials, his hopes or his sins or whatever it is, his, his, his needs. But he always ends by rejoicing in the person of God himself. God himself is the answer. And that's the theme we have of Psalm 23 as well. In fact, this whole psalm kind of jumps to the second part of what I just said. It's, it's a complete just uh, celebration of who God is. And it, that's made it the most beloved and famous poem in the most loved and famous book of poetry in the world. And we know at the beginning it's read, or sorry, it's uh, written by David, who was a shepherd and then he became the king of Israel. As far as I know, we don't know uh, at what point in his life that he wrote this, whether he was still a young shepherd or whether he was during his time as being a captain of the army for Saul, King Saul, or whether he was already a king himself. We don't know. Um, it could fit any part of his life because at every part of his life he knew fear and suffering and at every stage of his life he knew that God is the one who rescued him by power and grace. And so that's what he sings of. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, he says. And that's all we're really going to talk about today. Of course, the Lord is the shepherd, that means we're the sheep. And you know, it's never really a compliment to be called a sheep. Um, unfortunately, it's an accurate description of our relation to God. You see, sheep are needy, extremely needy. They depend on their shepherds for everything, for food and shelter, for guidance and protection from disease. A domesticated sheep cannot live without human intervention. If you release them to the wild, they die very quickly. And for, for one thing, their wool grows too fast and too thickly for them to rub it off themselves. So if a human doesn't come along to shear off the sheep's wool, that sheep will eventually die, at least from overheating. But also, they, if they wander around, they could get caught because of their wool. They cannot take care of themselves. They need intervention. They need a good shepherd. Now, David had been a shepherd for the early part of his life, so he knew all about sheep. And here he's thinking about God, and he's saying, I'm the sheep. God is the one who is my shepherd. I'm the one who needs everything. And so do we. All, all that we have is from him. And we take so much of it for granted. But God is our good shepherd who takes care of us even when we don't realize it. And he's infinitely patient with us too. Uh, the other thing you'll hear about sheep is that they are dumb really dumb. They are even too stupid to be afraid. So there's a sense in which <laughs> shepherds have called their sheep fearless, but it's not a compliment. It's not, oh, they're, they're brave. It's because they're too dumb to be afraid of things they should. They will walk right off a cliff if that's where they thought the grass was. And uh, when a sheep gets stuck in some crevice, and it seems to be a when, not an if, by the way, the shepherd is, has to go get it out often with quite a bit of pulling and yanking, may not feel very comfortable for the sheep. We don't always feel comfortable when God's rescuing us from jams that we've got ourselves in. And the thing is, even after, even after the sheep gets rescued, they often act kind of stupidly. And uh, I found a little video here. I wonder if it'll play. It's a very short thing of a shepherd who's just about, just rescued one of his sheeps. Watch what the sheep does here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a picture of us <laughs> when it comes to our ability to obey God and follow him. We're stuck in a mess of our own doing, trapped by our own sin and foolishness. And, and to God, it must look a little bit like this. He pulls us out, 
of one thing. He gives us the, the, the right path, the green pasture, where we can go free and safely, and we just kind of turn around and, and throw ourselves back in again. You know, Jesus, he, whenever he healed people, so often he healed and forgave people of, uh, of some malady, and then he said, go and sin no more, okay? Because that's what we tend to do. Even after we've been forgiven, we go back and we sin again. We jump, jump right back in that muddy ditch. Now, it's a good thing that our good shepherd never gives up or we would be lost. He doesn't run out of mercy, and we never stop needing it. Now, I have another picture to show you here. This is from a children's Bible. There's lots of illustrated Bibles for children, um, well, all different art styles, but I, I chose this one just because it seemed like this is one of the most common images that we think of when we picture you know, King David as a shepherd or uh, if you ever have this, the Psalm 23 being illustrated, you see a picture like this. He's usually depicted as a very young boy, um, very clean, kind of weak looking, but you know, gentle, non-threatening. And look how be well behaved his sheep are. They're just, he doesn't even have to look at them. He's you know, lost in his own world of the music. And it's a really beautiful, peaceful picture. It's kind of comforting. We'd love to have a life like that. Um, and I think this image is very popular because it kind of fits how we often feel about Psalm 23. It's a comforting psalm. It's beautiful. It, it makes us feel good and cozy even. But if the Lord is like this kind of shepherd, then the rest of the psalm doesn't really make a lot of sense. How could a boy like this protect us from the valley of the shadow of death? So I've got another picture to show you. And uh, this photograph is from the New York Public Library's digital collection. A little hard to see, but I hope you can make out some details. It shows a, a shepherd in Palestine, the area of modern Israel, about 100 years ago. He's an old man. He's very experienced. And I, I want to see if you can make out what he's holding here. He's got a long rifle slung under his shoulder. And in, in his hand, He's holding something that's resting up over his shoulder. That's his rod. I don't know if you can see it too well. It's about two and a half feet long. It's pretty thick and solid down where he's holding it. And it goes up over his shoulder. And you can see it gets a lot thicker up at the top. It turns into this very uh, heavy club at the end, a club that is a weapon, capable of crushing a human skull. That's the kind of psalm that, or that's, sorry, that's the kind of shepherd that Psalm 23 is depicting. One who is armed to the teeth and ready to kill any predator or bandit that would come after his flock. And I want you to remember something else from King David's life story. Do you remember when he was getting ready to go out and fight Goliath? He was still a, a very young man. Uh, he was not a trained warrior, and he was talking to King Saul, and King Saul was really worried. He didn't want to make David the champion, but everyone else was too afraid to go fight this enemy warrior who was a giant. And David is trying to convince Saul that he can do this. He says, Saul didn't know anything about shepherding. Okay, so and this passage is in 1 Samuel 17. David's educating the king on this, and he says, your servant, that's himself, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from a flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, I'm picturing a mane of a lion, and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So when we read the Lord is our shepherd, remember that our good shepherd is Jesus, and he is no weakling. He is almighty in power, and he will defend his sheep. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's Romans 8, 31. 
And see how Psalm 23 speaks of God's rod and his staff. These are images of his protection and guidance. Uh, you know, the shepherd's staff might be, sometimes it's that one we see that has a, a big curve at the end of it, a hook. That's often used to pull the sheep towards the shepherd at various times to help him guide it. And of course, we saw the rod in that picture of the, the old man shepherd. That rod is a weapon <laughs> to fight off attackers. But the rod also, I learned, uh, it's also used to count the sheep. When the sheep are passing by, uh, passing by the shepherd, usually when they're being brought into the sheepfold, he'll kind of hold up the, the rod and kind of tap them, you know, one by one to help them count the sheep. And so the rod, it's a symbol of God's protection of us, but it's also a reminder that he knows us personally. He knows exactly who belongs to him. And we're safe with him. No one can snatch us from his hand. Now, have you ever, have you ever worried that maybe you were just too lost to be saved by Jesus? Or perhaps you feel like that sheep that keeps jumping back into the ditch. I've sinned again and again and again. Does my repentance even mean anything? What is wrong with me? Well, I'm, I'm trying to say you don't have to fear if the Lord is your shepherd. Jesus picked up shepherd imagery several times in the New Testament when talking to his disciples. And uh, I've just picked one of these instances here. I'm in John chapter 10, verse 27. This is one of the most comforting statements to assure believers that their salvation is secure with him. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So yeah, you and I, we may be dumb sheep who keep getting ourselves into trouble a lot. We often disobey our shepherd and, and have to get some discipline from him and be pulled back. But we're not too much for our shepherd to handle. The Lord is active in caring for his people, and he'll aggressively attack your enemies. Sin was defeated on the cross. That's our enemy. There's another verse in the Bible that says the last enemy to be defeated is death. Death was destroyed at the resurrection, and we have a promise of eternal life. We know that the enemy, our devil, prowls around, attacking us, seeking to, uh, to, to tempt us into more sin. And yet, if you remember all the way back in Genesis, the, when the first sin had happened and Adam and Eve were hearing the consequences of their sin, God gave them a promise of salvation. He said, referring to the serpent who was Satan, he says, there will be one who will crush the serpent with his heel, and that is Jesus. There's a lot more that can be said about Psalm 23, but I, again, I'm just focusing on this fact. The Lord is our shepherd. And it's a mind-boggling thing to look at it. So uh, if you noticed, I don't know if I put it up here. If you notice when the, it's written out, the Lord is my shepherd, you'll notice that the word Lord is in all capital letters in every English translation. And that's significant. Okay? Sometimes when you see the Lord in the Bible, it's not in all capitals. And sometimes it is. Okay? These are translation conventions for two different Hebrew words. If you see Lord in, that has the lowercase letters, no, maybe a capital L, but then the rest are lowercase, um, that's translating the Hebrew word Adonai, which just means Lord. I mean, it means someone who's a ruler. It could be applied to a king or somebody else as well, but it was one of the titles given to God. Lord of Lords, that's uh, where it would be used too. But if you see Lord in all capital letters, that's translating a very, very different and very special name for God. It's God's personal name, um, Yahweh. So the, it's written in Hebrew with just four letters, which in English gets translated to Y-H-W-H. -H. Yahweh is just an approximated uh, name for it, but Right here, we see it first in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. This is when God's speaking to Moses through the burning bush. And Moses asks God, what name should I give the people of Israel, the, the Hebrews who are slaves in Egypt? You're going to send me to them, and, they're gonna, and I'm going to say, well, God sent me. And they're going to say, which God? 
Ra, Osiris? Which one of the Egyptian gods sent you? Is there some other god? Who, who is this? So what name do I tell them? And God says to Moses, he says, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered through all generations. Okay? Now, this name, Yahweh, with those four letters, it's related to a Hebrew verb meaning to be. And a little bit earlier from this, uh, God said, I am. Well, this is a, a version of, this is like the different tense of that verb. It means he will be. Yahweh means he will be. And the Hebrew scriptures use this over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. That's why you see the name Lord in all caps in the English translations so often throughout the Bible. This is the name that God uses to distinguish himself from the gods of any other religion. All members of the Trinity have this name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a personal name, just like Paul or Sarah or Sophon or Andrew. God is a personal being. He is not some distant force. But there's more than that. So Yahweh means he will be, and it's, as I said, it's related to the name I am. You may remember God said, I am that I am. This is a statement of complete self-existence. It means that God is the source of his own life, his own existence. He doesn't rely on anyone or anything else to make him who he is. He is absolute and eternal. He makes himself exist. We, we, we don't have minds that can comprehend a co absolute complete freedom, complete independence. Okay? Every, every time we use the word independence or freedom, we can only think of it in relation to something else that, you know, that we depend on or that somebody else depends on. But that's not God. He has no beginning, no end. He needs nothing. To use the language of the psalm, he wants for nothing. He lacks nothing. And that's why David says that he will need nothing at all because the shepherd who's giving him everything is never going to get poorer in the giving. There's only so much money or food or resources or whatever that you have that you could give away to someone else. Even emotionally, when, you, when we're giving out care and, and compassion to someone, man, we, we run dry sometimes. We, we, there's only so much energy and care that you can sometimes give, and if you're not being um, receiving that, people get drained and burned out, even in very loving relationships. That's not the case with God. He gives and gives and gives, and he never runs out, because everything originates from him, especially every good thing. Uh, Jesus applies this concept in Matthew, Matthew 6, 26. He's teaching his followers not to be anxious about the future. And he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I don't know about you, but me, when, when, I, when I read this and I think about it, I just, I can't not love God for this. He knows how sinful you are, and he knows your failures and weaknesses, the dirtiest and darkest corners of your soul. But the members of his flock, his sheep, man, he considers you the most valuable thing in all his creation. And he's not going to stop giving you what you need to become holy. And there's a very old hymn that starts like this. It says, why should I feel discouraged? I didn't put it up. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. We don't understand the vast scale that God works on. Now, just recently, I saw a headline proclaiming that astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, discovered what they think is maybe the brightest object in the universe that we've ever detected. Okay? It's a quasar. 
which is a, a glowing galactic core centered on a black hole, and it gives off so much energy that there's this va there's these vast clouds of gases, which, again, I, it's, I can't even conceive of these ga clouds of gases that are almost the size of the galaxy themselves that surround this, uh, this black hole, and there's so much energy being given off that these gases are being heated so hot and they give off so much light that they outshine all of the other stars in that galaxy. And we can barely detect them because they're often so far away. And some, for a long time, it was hard to detect these, these quasars because when our telescope saw them, we only saw one very bright light and we thought it was just another star. But with more advanced telescopes, they finally began to realize, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. And the black hole, with its overpowering gravity, um, it devours material around it. Okay, it sucks stuff in. And this one that they recently discovered, again, they think it's the biggest, uh, maybe, uh, and the brightest object they've yet seen. It's devouring material equal to the mass of our sun once a day. So how much bigger than our sun does it have to be in order to do that? Well, they estimate it's between 17 and 19 billion times bigger than the mass of our sun. And the brightness of its light is 600 trillion times greater than the light of our sun. I mean, we can do math with these numbers, but I don't think we can really understand them. And this is just one quasar all throughout the universe. There's billions of galaxies that we've been able to, to see and estimate and, and measure to some degree. And who knows how much more is beyond our ability to detect stars and nebulae and everything that God put there. And every atom of it is sustained by God. He keeps everything in existence by his very thought. If God were to stop thinking about a single atom for a single moment of time, it would just cease to exist. He holds up everything in the universe because he wants to. His eye is on the quasar, and his eye is on the sparrow, and he is your shepherd, and his eye is on you. You are the sheep of his pasture. Sheep are followers. We've seen that. Not very good followers, but they're followers. There's no, no domesticated sheep as much of a leader. And people are followers, too. We all follow someone or something all throughout our lives, teachers, influencers. And you've got to ask yourself, who are you following? Who is trying to lead you every day? Where do you spend your time? Who are you listening to? Okay? This applies even to the kids. I know you spend a lot of time online. Most of us do. Well, which influencers are you listening to? Which gamers or which singers are the ones who are speaking to you? And what are they telling you? And parents, do you know who is shepherding your children? And for that matter, adults, whether parents or otherwise, who's, who are you turning to for guidance? Who's telling you how you should vote or think about other people or how you should work or how you should value this or that? We're surrounded by voices that give us threats or promises to go this way or that way and any way except the way of God. We've got to remember who our shepherd really is. We are called out of the world to be led by Jesus, by Christ alone. He is our Lord, our eternal creator. And the most important question that you're going to have to answer for your life, is the Lord your shepherd? Not just a shepherd or somebody else's shepherd. Is he your shepherd? And I, I beg you, please make it so. Let him pull you from wherever you're stuck in whatever crevice in your life. Follow his voice home every time that he calls. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I, I thank you so much for your everlasting care and for the constant promises that you give us. We need to know the depth of our need for you, but we also need to know the absolute power and effectiveness of your gospel, the good news that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord, who pays the penalty for all of our sins once and for all, who gives us new life in the Holy Spirit, 
and a promise, not just of um, a, a slate wiped clean of our record of sin, but uh, actual change, that we are becoming new creatures in you, becoming like you in righteousness. Lord, help us to understand this. Help us to go with joy and confidence, to live according to your spirit, to walk by the spirit, to show more and more love for you and for each other. And we pray all of this in the name of our shepherd, Jesus. Amen.